Yo, what's up? Willow! Ah, uh, it's good to be back, family. How y'all doing? Y'all good? Uh, good. I don't know what just happened, but we ready to hurry up and get to the Bible before we get in trouble. Uh, Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7. Begin reading at verse 11. Luke chapter 7. Begin reading at verse 11. Hear these words of our Heavenly Father. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bear they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this great church. Thank you, Father, for this time together. Father, as we gather together to sit under your word, would you speak, O oh Lord? Your children have gathered to listen. Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. This woman was in trouble. She was in trouble. She was, she was walking. And as her feet were carrying her, her heart was still. The breath snatched out of her body because the pain she was feeling and the burden that she was carrying, her feet moved with the rhythm that unfortunately was too familiar. You see, although there was a dead body in front of her, these feet knew where to walk because They've been here before. She was a widow. So not only was she having to walk behind the body, the dead body of her little boy, but she remembers the time when she had to walk behind the dead body of the love of her life. And so she, here she is, another processional, walking behind another dead body, her heart broken, in two places. Not only is she walking behind this dead body, recognizing that she'd been in this pain before, but there's also another cultural reality that's taking place because not only is her heart broken, but her world, her economy is broken. You see, during this time, a widow with no child fit in this interesting place in culture. The word sets you up almost to be an adult orphan. There's a reason why the Bible says take care of orphans and widows because they have no home in society. The culture didn't have a place for a woman without a husband. Didn't have a place for a woman without a child. So while her feet are walking 
Her heart is broken. Her economy is broken. She's carrying a burden beyond anything that anyone could imagine. And she's walking behind this dead body carrying this weight. And Jesus comes and he sees the dead body. He sees the processional and he sees this woman. And then he says to her, but it's simply just unexpected. She's carrying this burden. She's carrying this weight. And then Jesus comes and then he says these words that are unexpected. And, 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 and there are times when we follow Jesus and we, we're in trouble and we in the midst of a crisis and Jesus comes. But when he speaks, honestly, if we were to tell the truth, sometimes he speaks and says stuff that's unexpected. I wish I could tell you every time you had a problem, he was going to come with the answer that you were looking for, with the answer that you expected, with the answer that you thought you were going to get. But can I just warn you, sometimes Jesus will show up on the scene in the midst of your crisis, but when he speaks, he says what you don't expect. He says what you didn't expect to hear. And to be honest, sometimes, sometimes, I, 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 maybe it's just me, but sometimes he says stuff and it doesn't even make, so I'm in a crisis I'm carrying a burden and Jesus comes and I would be a, I would be shouting that he was here but when he what he said I don't even understand doesn't even make sense what he says so now I got a burden and I'm confused I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm walking with Jesus, following Jesus, I can have a burden and he can show up and I'm still confused. I know to you, maybe he makes sense to you all the time. Maybe you understand everything he said. Maybe he answered your prayers in plain English. Like, but, but, but for me, sometimes what he says it doesn't even make sense. He comes up to this woman who's walking in this burden, who's behind her dead son, and he looks at her and he says, don't cry. Don't cry. If anybody is entitled to tears, it's this woman. If anybody should have a moment where she could have tears falling profusely down her face, it's a widow and a mama who's lost her baby. Jesus, you say to her, don't cry. If she can't cry, who can? She's entitled to tears streaming down her face. These are the moments where you got to stay with God and keep walking with God and keep listening to God even when you don't understand God. Because if you get frustrated and leave God prematurely, you will miss the blessing that he has for you on the journey. Don't allow your misunderstanding or your lack of clarity concerning God to cause you to prematurely walk away from God and find another solution. Because let me just tell you right now, you can search the world all over. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody do you like him. So even when you don't understand him, you got to stick with him. He's up to something. Uh, turn and tell your neighbor he's up to something. Oh, come on, you got a terrible neighbor. You should have sat by somebody else. Turn, to turn around and tell somebody else. Say, say, he's up to something. He says, he says, don't cry. It's interesting, Luke, Luke, Luke is the writer here in this passage, and Luke is writing uh, not in English, but in a language called Greek. And in Greek, he chooses an interesting word that's translated here. The word don't cry in the Greek is actually the word klio. Uh, klio, klio, klio. Um, and klio doesn't mean um, don't cry in the sense of don't allow tears to stream down your face. Clio doesn't mean that, uh, which is encouraging to me because Jesus is saying, don't, don't wipe your tears and act like you got it together when you really don't. 
he's 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 not saying that. He's not saying act like it ain't a big deal even when it is a big deal, but just act like it. Walking with Jesus isn't a sense of denial where you have to deny the realities. Act like it ain't that bad. Act like it ain't hard. Act like you ain't on the verge of giving them. He's not telling her, don't act like it. If you got to cry, cry. You got to let those tears stream down your face. There is room in the economy of God. There's room in the family of God for you to theologically lose it and still keep it together. The book of Lamentations is all about lamenting and frustrating and allowing venting and being angry and frustrated with where you are in God. So when you follow God, you ain't got to act like everything all right when it really ain't all right. You ain't got to wipe your tears when the tears need to flow. He's not saying be in denial with him. So he's not saying deny reality. Clio doesn't mean um, don't allow tears to stream down your face. Clio, what it means is this. It's, it's the idea of um, don't, don't lose it. Um, Clio is the idea of, it's kind of like the idea of falling apart. Um, uh, having an inability to hold it together. Uh, to, to, to walk in a sense of despair where there is no hope. Uh, Clio, the idea of sitting in a place that's dark with no light piercing through. He looks at her and she, he says, although it's hard right now, although it's difficult, although you're walking behind a dead body, don't give up. Don't lose it. Don't quit right here. Now is not the time to throw in the towel. Now is not the time to give up. Don't Clio. Don't cry. Don't cry as though there is no hope. Don't cry as, there, as though this is the end of your journey. No, don't Clio. My brothers and sisters, I have come all the way from uh, Los Angeles, California on American Airlines Flight 1594 to look you in your face and to tell you if you are on the verge of giving up, if you're on the verge of throwing in the towel, if you came here and you're on the brink of quitting, if you came here and you don't know how you're going to make it, if you came here and it's so dark that you don't see the light of the hope of God. If you came here and you about to give up on your marriage, if you about to give up on yourself, if you about to throw in the towel, I came here to tell you, don't Clio, don't quit, don't throw in the towel. God is not through with you. Don't quit. Don't give up. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. He didn't bring you this far for you to stuck and die here. You ain't going to die here. You ain't going to quit here. You ain't going to give up here. God is just getting started with you. If you still got breath in your body, there's still purpose in your chest. Lift your head up. Stick your chest out. Put one foot in front of the other and keep going because he's not through with you yet. Don't cry out. Don't give up. I don't know who I came to talk to today, but there's somebody where Satan's been whispering in your ear, saying you need to give up. Give up on your marriage. Some of you been financially has been so hard you want to give up on just being able to provide. Some of you, your children have disappointed you yet again, and you've given up belief that God's going to do something greater in them. Some of you, you're on the verge of even giving up on the church. You say, this is going to be my last son after this, I'm done with it. I'm just so frustrated, it's just a mess, I'm done with it. See, Satan wants you to stop right now. Because if you stop right now, you'll never see what I know to be true. Because I've already read the end of the book. And I know you're going to come out of this with victory. You're going to come out of this with power. But if you give up now, you'll miss what he has for you. So I want to encourage you, some of you, you've been wanting to give up. Some of you, I don't know who you are, but Satan's been telling you, you need to give up on you. Some of you, some of you, Satan had the audacity to make you begin to believe that you being not here is a better option. So you've been thinking about taking your life because you think it'll be better for you not to be here. I came all the way to tell you, my flight was delayed, but it wasn't denied. 
he shouldn't have never, the devil shouldn't have never let me land at Chicago O'Hara, pass by Garrett's Popcorn, got in the car, got off of Barrington Road, and came down to Willow Creek. He should have never let me in that parking lot because I've come to tell you the devil is a liar. You are not giving up on you. You are not giving up on the church, and you are not giving up on God. It's your time. It's your season. It may feel like hell right now, but there's a breakthrough on the way. I wish I had a witness in here. You ought to be encouraged to know this is not the time to give up. This is not the time to quit. No weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God's going to get some glory out of this. I said, God's going to get some glory out of this. He's going to get some glory out of this. He says, don't Clio. Don't you quit. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you are. I don't care how bad it is. God sent me here to tell you, don't you quit. Don't you call the divorce lawyer back and say, hold off. We're going to go to a counselor. We're going to put this marriage in God's hands. It ain't time to put this marriage in the judge's hands. It's time to put it in God's hands. He says, don't quit. If I can hear you now, tell me, Albert, why not quit? We go, let's, let's, let's argue back and forth. I got, you know, they put a clock on the brother here. I got 18 minutes, 56, 55, 54, 53 seconds to argue with you. So I'm going to argue with you. Why, why not quit? Well, because Jesus is here. And when Jesus comes, he brings his power and his presence and his purpose. And you can't quit in the presence of his power and his purpose. Jesus is there. But not only is Jesus here, but you need to know that Jesus, he sees you. He says that to the woman. He says, I see you. Um, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, one of, the, one of the coolest things in the world is when you come to one of, to one of our funerals. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm sorry, not, not our funerals, <laughs> but our funeral, yeah. Uh, Y'all not getting it. Uh, <laughs> our funeral. Let, let, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. A black funeral, I'm telling you, don't you die and go to heaven without going to see a funeral of someone who's died and going to heaven that's black. I'm telling you. We don't even call it a funeral. We call it a home-going celebration. No, oh, I wish I had a witness. <laughs> we... We, now, 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 white folks, before y'all go packing up and going to this funeral, let me warn you now. Some of y'all, let me, let me help you out. It, it has the potential to go from two to seven hours. So you need to pack some snacks. It's going to be several, it's going to be several intermissions. Put you some, uh, some Cheez-Its in your purse, a Capri Sun, and some, and some Cran Apple Juice so you can make it through. Uh, um, I, I, when I tell you, it, it's, it's a beautiful celebration. Um, there'll be moments of tears, uh, moments of shouting and dancing. Uh, uh, there, and, and there'll be entertaining moments, uh, watching the family try to keep Uncle Jimmy from getting to the microphone, because if he get to the microphone, Aunt Agnes going to get up out that casket and walk out the building. Uh, I don't feel bad about that because every, every family got an Uncle Jimmy that we don't want near no microphone at any family function at all. Um, it's this beautiful display of, of, of emotion and expression as we celebrate the life of one who's been lost. But let me tell you something. As, as dramatic and as amazing as a black funeral is, it pales in comparison to the drama of a Jewish funeral. Let me tell you, a Jewish funeral, they, 
regular criers and mourners weren't good enough. They had to go get professionals. So they would actually hire mourners to come and cry at the funeral. Like, how you interview for that job? Uh, regular criers uh, interview at, at 3. Uh, at 4.45, the ugly cry of uh, interviewees are going to come down for the ugly cry. You know, like, what in the world? They got professional mourners. Not only that, but they have special musicians that are just funeral musicians. And listen to this mix-up. It's, they play the flute and the cymbal. First of all, that combination makes me want to cry. Like, how can that sound good? <laughs> Bang! Like, what is what? Like, that don't even sound, that ain't even a good combination. You know what I mean? So you got that. You got professional mourners over here. You got a flute and cymbal players over here. And then you got the friends and neighbors and people that know about it. In the midst of that, behind this dead body, you got the widow walking. Jesus walks in the midst of all that commotion, amidst all she's got around her going on. He looks at her and says, I see you. Some of you are in here and you got a whole lot of commotion going on around you. You got stuff going on around you, front, side, back. You got emotional stuff, spiritual stuff, economical stuff. You got all kinds of stuff going on. You Things are losing and going crazy on multiple levels. Family, work, church, cousins. You got all kinds of stuff. But I'm telling you, in the midst of all you got going on, in the midst of your complexity, he is not confused by your complexity. He still sees you in the midst of it all. He says, I see you in the midst of it all. With all you got going on, it ain't too complex for me to be able to see you in the midst of it all. He sees her. He says, I see you. Not only that, but it's, it's interesting. Um, Luke, as he's writing in Greek, he chooses an interesting word there. The word for I see you is blepo. Uh, blepo is the idea of I, I, I see you in that pink shirt. I, I, I see you up there in the white uh, little, little shirt. I see you all the way up in the top on the third level with the gold chain hanging out, sitting on the back row. Uh, I, see, I see you uh, with your hand in a very interesting place on your face. It looks like it's in your nose, which is unfortunate <laughs> for when we hold hands at the end of service. Um, I, 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 it's the idea of I see you with the W right there on the second balcony. It's like, Albert, I see you in that, uh, in that tight blue shirt you got on. Um, you know how you lose a little weight and you go shopping and then you realize... I hadn't lost as much as I thought I had. You know? It really ain't got nothing to do with the sermon. I just needed to breathe for a little while. I've been, <laughs> been holding it in. Now I say, I got to let all that out. Nobody, don't nobody want to see all that on camera, Jesus. You know what I mean? So I, but I've been holding it in a long time now. I got 13, four, 13, 46, 47, 43 more seconds. <sighs> all right, let me finish. Okay, um, <laughs> blepo is the idea of I, I, I see you, but that's not the word Luke uses. Luke uses a different word. He uses the word for see. He uses the word iodon, iodon, which doesn't mean I see you. Better translated, it means I see in you. I, 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 I see in you. He says to this woman, I see the stuff in you that the person sitting next to you can't see. See, I, I, I see the stuff that you're carrying that nobody knows about. And I want you to be encouraged, not just that Jesus is here, not just that Jesus sees you, but y'all, I'm telling you, he sees in you. He can see the stuff the person sitting next to you can't see. He can see the stuff that you're carrying that, shh, you don't talk about. He can see the anxiety and the things that you're struggling with that you couldn't even enter into worship because the burden you're carrying is so heavy you can't even lift your hands because you're so overwhelmed with what you're carrying in your hands. He says, I, I see you. I see the struggle. I see the addiction. I see the failure. I see the discouragement. I see in you. I can see in you what no one else can see. He says, in the midst of all, I can see in you because we can fake it. We can fake it with one another. You can fake other folks. Some of you, we already just did it. Folks was asking, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. So glad to be here. Shut up. You just lying. <laughs> you cried yourself to sleep last night. It took all your head to get out the bed and to walk into church today. That's why you at the 1115 service, you almost didn't make it. <laughs> you meant to be here at 8. God, um, says, in the midst of all you're carrying, I see in you. And watch this. 
and with what I see in you, I'm not repelled by you. See, I don't know about your friends. With my friends, sometimes when I have needs, all of a sudden, when I'm serving them, they fine. But when all of a sudden I get needy, they get allergic to my needs. They start sneezing. Oh, I'm allergic to helping you. All of a sudden, your nose running. You, you allergic to me. But in your time of most need, Jesus isn't allergic to you. He doesn't move away from you. As a matter of fact, he moves towards you. He says to this woman, I saw you, and I saw you, watch this, with compassion. My heart moved toward you. Dennis Keating, a pastor in California, he says, compassion is when your pain can live in my heart. Jesus says, your pain, I can feel it in my heart. And when I saw you, I didn't want to move away from you, to be honest. It brought me closer to you. Alcoholics Anonymous had this amazing inspirational speaker. This speaker would travel across the world and talk about the power of AA and the impact that it had on his life. Um, he's standing in a gathering in a big arena, and a guy sitting on the third row, and the guy sitting on the third row was an addict. He refused to get help, and his family finally convinces him to come to this gathering. As soon as this guy gets done speaking, he's just magnetic. He's, he's just beautiful. Everyone's drawn to his words. Immediately, as soon as he got done, the addict makes a beeline to the speaker. He says, sir, tell me, why, why do I have to go to AA? Why, does, why is AA the best for me? Tell me. He says, well, sir, I'm glad you asked. He says, what you need to understand is when someone's grabbed and gripped by addiction, they're in the ditch of their life. It is the lowest place in their life. They are in the ditch of their life. And when people are in the ditch of their life, people around them, they just kind of got a habit. They, they tend to throw ropes. They throw them a rope of encouragement. They throw them a rope of resources. Sometimes they throw them a rope of money, thinking if they had money, they could get the help that they need and they wouldn't have to be that. They throw them these ropes. Sometimes we even throw the rope of prayer. I'm praying for you. Here's a rope. He says, but we in Alcoholics Anonymous, we know that in the ditch of your life, you don't need a rope. So we throw the rope away, and what we do is we jump down in the ditch with you. Now, one would say, well, what you going to do that for? Now both of us are in the ditch. <laughs> yeah, we both in the ditch, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. I know the way out. I guess what I'm telling you, if you find yourself in the ditch of your life, open your eyes. Jesus is right there in the ditch with you. And he's saying, give me your hand. I know the way out. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you ain't got to be scared because th thou art with me. He says, I'm with you. So open your eyes. See the presence of Jesus. See that he was there the whole time and he sees you and all you got to do is give him your hand. He wants to walk you through your valley. He wants to walk you through this darkness. Open up your eyes. The light is piercing through and he has come to carry you out. He's come to carry you. He's come to carry you. He sees her. And then third and finally, Jesus says to the woman, not only am I moved towards you, not only do I see you, but then he looks at the dead thing she's walking behind. Because some of us are walking behind a dead thing. The thing that, that broke our heart. The thing that, that we gave up on. And let me tell you something. When you got a dead thing in your life, you don't talk to it or you don't touch it because culture and family dynamics say, don't you talk about that. Don't you bring that up. Don't you touch that. So, so we're not going there. We're going to act like it doesn't exist. But Jesus looked at the thing that she was going to let go of and never come back to, and she was just going to be burdened by it. See, there are things that you just want to forget about. There are things that you just want to let go and act like it didn't happen. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to touch the very place that you want me to avoid. I'm going to touch the very place that's starting to smell in your life. 
I'm going to touch. Do y'all get the metaphor? Are y'all with me up in here? I'm going to touch. I'm going to go to the very place that you don't want to go. In your marriage, the forgiveness and the bitterness, the unforgiveness and the bitterness that you hold, that's the very thing I'm going to touch. The stuff you walk around in your house all day and all night, you don't touch it. You walk around it. He says, I'm putting my hand right there. That's what I'm going to touch. And then not only did he touch it, but then he started talking to it. He started talking to a dead thing. Why? Because he wanted us to know that he's the God who has resurrection power and he can talk to dead things. He can touch dead things and they'll come back to life. They'll come back to life. Culturally, you know, Jews took their purity very, very seriously. So to touch something that's dead was absolutely illegal and it warranted um, uh, a cere- he was considered ceremonially unclean, socially unclean. He would have had to go and, 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 and be cleansed again. He was tainted. But Jesus was willing to risk it all, including cultural and social lo- laws and norms in order to bring this boy back to life. He touches him. The word there for touch is a very interesting word. Uh, Luke, Luke grabs an interesting word. He, he uses the word hepsado. Hepsado means to touch, but to touch in a way not to nurture uh, or not to, to care for, not to say like they're there, to comfort. But the word hepsado means to touch with the intention to manipulate and control to manipulate and control. It's not to care for, uh, to, to, to comfort by saying they're there. No, it, it's really to, to manipulate and control, more like to say come here, to, 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 to control it, to manipulate, to come here. It, it, it's kind of like this. When, when I was sick as a little boy, I'm going to tell you something. There was no greater touch than the touch of my mother. Oh, she would comfort me. I, I just feel better. I, I, when my mama would come, if I was sick, she'd rub my back and rub my arm. And the way she'd comfort me with her touch, there, there, son. I'm, I'm tell, now, I'm sure the Benadryl and Claritin was, was also helping a lot, too. But, but it was something about my mama's touch and that, that hand just of warmth and comfort. And then there were other times when that same hand... would have different intentions. Uh, she, she grabbed that same arm, but with different intentions. Uh, there, there were times when, when I'd be about to walk into the street and get hit by a car or something. That same hand would, would grab me, and it wouldn't be to grab me to comfort me. It would grab me with the intention to manipulate and control. Uh, she would grab me, and, and, she, and, and it was as if she said, come here, and, 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 and come here. And she would pull me and yank my arm. Anybody ever been caught up by my one arm, and my feet would levitate off the ground and just move me off the I didn't even know what happened. My one arm almost pulled it out of socket, and she had a way, and she'd do it with a smile on her face because there'd be other people around, and she didn't want other people to know her abusive tendencies. So she had a, she had an ability to smile and talk to her talk through her teeth and say, come here. And I'm just, because she was snatching me and bringing me from danger to safety. And if she needed to manipulate and control my arm, she did whatever she had to do so she can bring me back to the place where she was destined for me to be. If you got it early, I wouldn't have to preach as long. Jesus grabbed this boy and said, with manipulation and control, I have come to grab you and snatch you out of the hand of death. And says, come here back to life. God's got a way of putting his hand in your situation and he wants to manipulate it. He wants to control it and he wants to bring you back. He'll say to a dead marriage, come here back to life. He'll say to dead finances, come here back to life. He'll say to a dead situation, come here back to life because he wanted you to know that he is the God that has resurrecting power. He can speak to the dead places in your life and say, come here, I've come to bring you back to life. No, it's not your time to die. No, it's not your time to give up. No, you ain't going in the ground today. Come here, I've come to bring you back to life. He wants you to know that you serve a God who has resurrecting power. And when you see God's resurrecting power, when you see it in your life, it says they grabbed the dead boy, gave it to their mother. Last point and then I'm going home. He says, 
they were in awe and they praised him. Not only do you need to recognize the resurrection power and it being on display in your life, but you've got an obligation to respond to the resurrecting power that is on display and in your life. He is bringing dead things to life, not just in me, but around me. And he says, and your response should be awe and, and praise to him. Now, now, now church, I, I'm just going give to me, give me two minutes. I just need to teach you this. Your response to him cannot just be in your heart. I know we live in a town where we just say, well, Albert, I'm, I'm, I'm not charismatic. I don't, I don't do all of that. I'm a very unemotional person. So I like to respond to him in my heart. That ain't enough. I'm just going to tell you that right now. That, that ain't enough. God requires that you respond to him with praise, not just in your heart. And that's true because here's the deal. Every great gift demands a great response. Every great, and it's not just a, a biblical spiritual principle. It's just a life principle. It's, it's very practical in every day, every area of your life. I went to a Prince concert. Prince concert. Prince was at the L.A. Forum uh, years ago. He did 21 shows. I was there for about 20 of them. I, I tell you, I love Prince. But the first time Prince did a concert, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it, was, it scared me because he did a two-hour show, and Prince finished the show and didn't sing Purple Rain. That's what I said. I was like, what? Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> y'all, they turned the lights up. Prince left the stage. The band was gone. So, y'all, we, we weren't leaving. We were standing right there. We started screaming, purple rain, purple rain. We started chanting. Folks, it was almost a riot broke out. Folks started throwing stuff. When I threw the first cup, I didn't think it was going to turn into a big fight, but I just, I was just upset. So they start doing it, and then all of a sudden, y'all, the lights went down. And all of a sudden, from the stage, purple lights just came on. <laughs> I immediately started worshiping. <laughs> y'all, Prince came up on the stage. I'm telling you, and he started playing that guitar at the beginning of the song. True story, I started crying. I looked down at my hand, it was purple tears. I said, oh. <laughs> and then it happened. Prince said that first line, never meant to cause you any trouble. trouble. <laughs> Woo, y'all, I'm telling you, if he would have done an altar call, I would have came down and joined the church of the Purple Rain. I would have come down. Now, how would it have looked if I was up there and he doing all that and I'm sitting in the audience saying, I am moved in my heart at Prince's clear articulation of the rain that is purple. I am moved by his melodic motivations and how it is that he can sing so clear. No, I wasn't. There. I was up there, purple rain, purple rain. Why? Because every great gift demands a great response. If you look at Michael Jordan back in the 90s, when he would come and fly over somebody and dunk on their head, how would it look? Me sitting there saying, I am so moved and compelled <laughs> at Michael's vertical ability. His vertical ability to fly over an individual and to intensely place the ball within the circle hoop with the net. <laughs> it moves me deeply in my heart. No, you was jumping up, knocking folks over, knocking popcorn, wasted your beer, I mean your Coke all over the place. You was doing that. Why? Because every great gift demands a great response. The, a couple of months ago when Tiger gave the greatest, greatest comeback of all times, he hit that golf shot in. People weren't like, oh, wow. <laughs> Tiger has yet done it again. And I am so grateful in my heart that I have witnessed one of the greatest comebacks of all time. As he receives a green jacket, my heart is green with envy <laughs> within my heart. No, you was jumping up and down. You was like, yes, Tiger, yes. I just watched the greatest comeback of all times. Well, all I'm trying to say is if you can get that excited about a tiger, let me tell you about a lamb. They marched him up a hill called Calvary. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He bowed his head. For me, he died. 
and on the Sunday morning, he got up with all power. He has resurrection power. And the resurrected king is resurrecting me. And he's resurrecting everything around me. He's resurrecting your marriage. He's resurrecting your life. He's resurrecting your church. And you ought to give him glory for being a resurrected king. Oh, come on, Willow. He's resurrecting your church. He's resurrecting your community. He's resurrecting you. He's res- giving some glory. Resurrected King. The resurrected King is resurrecting you. So you can go to work tomorrow and look at dead stuff, look at dead situations, and just remind yourself He's a resurrected God. Some of you in a marriage, and when you get discouraged, you need to look at your marriage and say, He's a resurrected God. Some of you need to go in your kid's room. I know you got teenagers. They didn't act like they didn't lost their mind like the devil living in your house. You need to go in that messy junkie room, get in the middle of it and just say, he's a resurrecting God. He's a resurrecting God. Next time you come to Willow Creek on a Sunday morning, don't you come in here one day without acknowledging the power and the glory that he wants to unleash in this place. You walk in here and you say, Willow, he's a resurrecting God. He's resurrecting all things in this place. Give him glory in him. He's resurrecting and we are in praise. We are in all of his glory. Come on. He's resurrecting in this place. So Father, we thank you for a vision that's greater than anything we could imagine. You didn't bring us this far for us to quit now. So all the, although the devil been busy, you ain't got nothing on the hand of God and what he wants to do in this place. I pray for this church, no weapon formed against it, all weapons forming all over the place, but they ain't gonna prosper in Jesus' name because God's got a plan, God's got a purpose, and he's not through yet, so don't cry out, don't give up. We gonna stay the course, and we gonna see what the end's gonna be for his glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being a resurrecting God. So we walk in your resurrecting power. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you, Willow. Have a good week.